are great, how to set up and play. So the first thing we'll do is we'll set up the event markers. If this is a two-player game, the first thing we'll do is remove these four events from the game, the Hamburg Credit Crisis, Navigation Acts, Opium War, and Economic Crisis. Separate the bureaucracy and the end of the game, and then shuffle the rest. The bureaucracy event is going to be shuffled with two randoms and placed as the first three events. The fourth event will be a random, and the last event is always the end of game. So bureaucracy is always one of the first three events, randomly determined, and then put a random in the fourth spot. Next are the economy markers for food, clothes, cutlery, and lamps. If it's a two-player game, remove all markers uh, with red threes, then shuffle them and randomly place them face down on that spot of the board. The leftovers are simply removed from the game. Next, set up the appeal chart. Place one cube of each player color, so I'm setting this up for a three-player game red, yellow, and blue, and also place one black cube in each column to represent the importer. Set player get discs on value 10 of the share value track. The game is won by the player that has the highest portfolio, the share value multiplied by the number of stocks in their possession. Next, you set up all the workers for the game. If this is a two-player game, Remove eight workers from the game and return them to the box. And then you add workers to the fired workers area. In a two-player game, we would put four workers from the job market. In a three-player game, which this is, we'll set eight workers here. And in a player game, we'd have four fired workers to start the game. Whenever workers are taken from the job market, they're always taken in reading order. So left to right, top to bottom. Whenever they're workers are returned from the fired worker spot, they're returned in reverse order. Next, we'll set up the advanced action markers. Uh, in a two-player game, you remove two complete sets of action markers. Since this is a three-player game, I'm removing one complete set. So four light blue and four dark blue are gonna get removed from the game in a three-player game. Shuffle the rest and place them face down on their corresponding spots based on the number of players in the game. Unused ones are removed from the game. Next, set up all the ships. If this is a two player game, you only use these four level two ships. At all other player counts, you use all the ships. Next, set up the development tiles. The charisma and one inventor tile, development tile are always used in every game. So set those out and then randomly draw development tiles based on the player count. In a two player game, we would draw 12 additional. In a three player game, 19 additional. And in a four player game, 26 in addition to the starting two. Now you can ever only have uh, tiles equal to one less than the player count. So in a three player game, we could only ever have two accountants in the game. So stack likes, and if you did draw a third one in a three-player game, simply put that back in the bag and redraw. Next, we'll place the decade tokens. So one on this mat, and then one token up here. This will track the rounds throughout the game. Now for each player, give them their factory board. Give them price markers. For each of the four goods, give them a number of shares. They'll start with 15 shares in their possession, and there'll be 15 shares that the bank owns. You can set up the bank money. I'm going to use poker chips, or you can use the paper money that comes with the game. The first round of the game, or the first decade, 1760, is called a setup or a preparation round. So in turn order, each player chooses their first factory that they'd like to acquire. You can ever only have one factory 
for each good, but you could have a factory for all four goods. So you could have a food, clothes, cutlery, and lamp factory, but you'd ever only have one food factory. And you're always limited by the level of factory based on the game round. So since we're in round one, we can only get level one factories. And then throughout the game, you have to modernize these in order. So once you have a level one factory, you can modernize to a level two and then a level three as long as you're doing it sequentially. But in round one of the game, we're limited to level one factories. So in turn order, each player selects one factory. So for example, let's say I select the cutlery factory and I simply place it on my player mat. I'm not gonna pay the cost yet until we get further in the setup round. Once the player selects their factory, they're also gonna take workers from the job market to fill up the first two shifts for that specific factory. And this is a setup thing only. Normally when you build a factory with the factory action, you only get to take one shift of workers, but as part of this setup round, you get two complete shifts of workers. So you can see for the cutlery factory, the first shift requires two workers divided by this white line, and the second shift requires three workers. If I, was, if I chose a bread factory instead, I'd get one, two, three, four workers to fill the first two shifts. The number of occupied shifts determines the capacity of the factory. So since this is a level one factory, my first shift produces one cutlery good during a production cycle. And you can also see this here. If it was a level two factory, it also produces one, a level three factory. And if it was a level four factory, the first shift would produce two goods. But that's also indicated on the factory tile. So the first shift produces one, second shift one, third shift two, and the fourth shift would not produce a good. The final thing you do is taking your factory during setup is you set your starting price for the good. And you can set this as anything you'd like, but one important concept is this will affect the appeal of your goods uh, to the domestic English market. The appeal is always calculated as the quality, the base quality of the factory, which in this case, a level one cutlery factory is 10, plus any quality, plus any distribution, minus your price. So in here we have 10 plus no modifiers minus a starting price of eight. So my appeal is two. And so I would adjust the yellow player. And so their cutlery has an appeal to the English market of two. You can never price your goods in such a way that your appeal would go below zero. And it's important to remember that the appeal of your good affects a couple things. It affects the maximum amount of goods you'll be able to sell to the English market. So I can sell two goods to the domestic English market. And it also will determine the order in which I sell. So if another player has higher appeal than I do, they will sell first uh, to the market during a production cycle. So think of it as the domestic market having a demand for goods based on the current employment levels in the country. And then beyond that, there's a maximum demand for your good based on the appeal of your good, the quality and the distribution minus your price. Once all players have selected their first factory, now all players in reverse turn order will select their second factory following the same steps. So for my second factory, I chose a bread factory. I filled two shifts of workers. I'm going to set my price at five. So I know my appeal is eight minus five. So my appeal is three. A good rule of thumb just for the first round is I base that on my maximum production. So I see that two shifts, I can, I'm able to produce three goods. So I priced it in such a way that I can at least sell a maximum of three goods to the English domestic market. The next step of the first round, in reverse order, 
all players will get to do an abridged stock action. Basically, they'll get to sell shares uh, back to the bank as startup capital. So you'll remember each player started with 15 shares. They can sell any number of shares back to the bank for money. They don't start with any money until they sell these starting shares. You have to sell enough at least to cover your starting factory expense. For each share you sell back to the bank, you'll get 10 pounds, because that's where the current value is. And a general rule of thumb is to sell back anywhere between five to 10 shares. So in this example, I sold back six shares to the bank to take 60 pounds of starting capital. This step also allows each player, once they decide how many shares to sell back, that little checkbox indicates that you're allowed to take a special marker from the game. The three types of special markers are the ships, the special action markers, or the development tiles. Just like the factory levels are limited by the game round, so are the ship markers and the action markers. So since we're in these decades, this first round, players are only allowed to take from this first row. Development tiles are not limited that way, so all development tiles that were drawn are available at the start of the game for selection. There is a way to exceed the current game level, but that requires that you have the inventor tile, which we'll cover later. So again, the types of special markers, the first one you have are these action markers. Basically, these are improved versions of your basic actions, plus a production action that you don't, each player does not have as a starting action. The ships um, allow players to ship goods as either an action all by itself or uh, at the end of a production cycle. If you take a ship, the workers are hired when the ship is taken, and if the ship was ever discarded, uh, the workers get fired with the ship. So you can see the level two ships don't require any workers, but if we were later in the game and we, were, we had access to these and a player took this ship, they would immediately hire a worker from the job market and place it on their harbor mat in this area. Each player has a limit of only two ships they can place on their harbor mat, but you may replace a ship as long as you're replacing it with a ship of higher capacity, even if the ship was used as part of an action earlier in the round, you would simply swap the ship there. And then you'd always use just the combined number of workers. So if later in the game I had a level four and a level six ship, it would require me to have three workers on my harbor mat to maintain those ships. And then again, the third type of special uh, marker are the development tiles. Each player can only ever have a maximum of four at any one time. You can never have duplicates or an identical development tile. Um, that goes with these also but the light blue and the dark blue are considered different because most of the time they have different values. You can see a maximum of seven, a maximum of 10 in administrative cost, which we'll cover later. You can ever only have four development tiles, but you are allowed to return and replace them. So if you had four and you chose a new one, you would just have to discard one from your player area. And these give you access to special abilities throughout the game. So in this example, yellow player, since I can take from row one, we'll just take the production special action and just add it to my list of basic actions. Once all players have decided how many shares to sell back to the bank and have chosen their special action marker, you do that at the same time in reverse player order. Then we go to the final step of the preparation round where each player now has to just pay for their factories. The factory expense is listed right there. So in this example, I would have to play eight plus 10, so 18 pounds to the bank from my starting capital. The reason why the decision to set how many shares to sell at the beginning of the game is important is because if at any time you're unable to fully pay for an action, uh, you have to do what's called an emergency uh, share sale. So you're allowed to sell the number of shares that you need to fully pay for the action that you've chosen. You're not allowed to sell more than that. 
and you'll get money equal to the current value of your share for each share that has to be sold but you take a penalty on the stock track chart so the first thing you'll look at is for each share sold your marker will drop based on where it currently is so if it and you always look at the first digit so if I was here on space 22 and I sold two shares for each share sold my marker would drop two. So let's say I sold two shares, one, two, one, two. Whereas if I was on 19 and I sold two shares, the first digit is one, I would drop one spot for each of the shares sold. If you had no more short shares left, you can take loans. Uh, each loan is worth 10 pounds, and for each loan you take, you've got to drop um, one on the share track. Those get repaid at 13 pounds, for each loan and that's repaid during the stock action which we'll cover later. Once all players have paid for their factory we advance the round marker and we're ready to start the first full round of the game. So for each game round the first thing we do is we check for obsolete factories then we'll have a production cycle for each of the four goods then we'll have end of round paying for um, warehouse workers and ship workers and then we'll resolve this event. So the first thing we do is check for any obsolete factories. You'll see in the early rounds there aren't any, but when we get to this round all level 1 factories are considered out of date and so you require additional workers uh, to maintain production in those factories. So for each level 1 factory you have to add two workers to maintain production in those factories. Those workers come straight from the fired workers section, not from the job market, and they just get placed on the factory. The factory is still allowed to produce during the production cycle. It just requires additional labor to maintain it. If and when this factory gets modernized past the obsolete level, the workers can simply be returned back to the fired workers area. But we're in a round that doesn't have any obsolete factories, so the first thing we do is resolve the economy marker. This will tell us how many spots the importer moves, as well as how many fired workers get returned to the job market. So we can see the importer will move once, since we're in the bread column, and we're going to return two fired workers back to the job market and those always get placed in reverse reading order back to the job market. This can get removed and we're ready to start the action phase for the active good. So during the action phase this is done in turn order so starting with the start player each player can do one of two things they can place one action marker in their column to take the action, or they can repeat an action of an action marker that was placed in a prior production cycle. So they could take, if they want to take the factory action, they would simply place it right there. If this was a subsequent production cycle and this was already here and they wanted to take this action again, they could say, I'm going to take this action again. To retake an action, it costs a two pound fee that goes straight to the bank and that's not used to consider the administration costs. That's important to keep in mind because once you place your marker you're required to pay the administration costs associated with that row. So by placing the factory here I, I pay two pounds of administration cost. If I'm reusing this action I pay my two, two pound fee to the bank and then I repay the administration cost based on the row um, that the action marker is in. You're going to see as we cover the actions the amount of administration I pay is important because for some actions it affects the power of the action. That's why it's important to remember that the fee for reusing one is not considered part of the administration fee. So if I was reusing this action I pay my two fee then I pay my six so I'm considered to have six administration fee are placing this in this row or by reusing it in that example. Each action marker 
once it's played, allows you to take a bonus action indicated on the bottom of the action marker. There are two types of bonus actions. The first one is this pound symbol that allows you to adjust prices. Any factories that were affected by the action that you took, you're allowed to adjust your price in those factories. Otherwise, you're not normally or you're not freely able to adjust prices without that special action. The second type of special action is the check mark box, and that allows you to take a special marker. So again, a ship, a special action marker, or a development tile. In lieu of taking a special action marker, you can instead reassign one of your development tiles. So some development tiles affect a particular factory. So instead of taking a new one, I may decide um, to reassign a development tile from my bread factory to my cutlery factory. So that is an option instead of taking one of these. So, so let's go over each of the actions now. This first action marker is considered the factory action. It allows you to build new factories, modernize existing factories, or even close existing factories. You can build and modernize as many as you desire or can afford. Um, you're always limited by level, so keep that in mind. Since we're in this round of the game, I couldn't modernize my factories to a level 2 factory yet, but if I was in a later round, I could build a closed factory and modernize it um, even up to multiple levels with one factory action. So when you build a new factory, you place it on your player board and you're allowed to add one shift of workers. So let's say I take this factory action, I place it there, I pay my two administration costs, and I decide I'm gonna build a clothes factory and a lamps factory. So in this example, I built a closed factory, I get one shift, that's different than setup when you get two shifts. When you build new factories during the normal factory action, you only get one complete shift. It always has to be the leftmost shift, and I have to pay the cost of the factory. So I immediately have to pay the nine pounds to the bank. If I also decide with the same factory action I want to also build a lamp factory, I pay the 11 for a level one lamp factory, and I get the first complete shift. In this example, there's three spots for my first shift. You can also modernize factories. So let's say I was in a later round of the game where I could modernize up to a level 3 factory. I can modernize as many factories as I want or can afford. You have to modernize in order. So even though I can go up to a level 3, I have to modernize this to a level 2 first. So I take the level 2. You can replace it or just put it on top. I pay the 11 pounds. And I want to modernize again. Modernize it to 11, a level 3. And I pay the 13 pounds. If the factory uh, was obsolete and it had those extra two workers, this is when they would get returned to the fired area spot when I'm modernizing the factory past the obsolescence level. The third thing I can do with a factory action is I can shut down a factory. Now, it can't be a factory that I just built with that action, uh, and vice versa. I can't close a factory and then rebuild the same one with the same action. Uh, but maybe I decide to get out of the cutlery business. I shut down this factory. I remove all workers from the factory. Um, if there were any machines, which we'll cover, those get removed also. I am allowed to keep any warehouse goods, though. So let's say I, I, I produced some goods and they were on my warehouse, which we'll cover. Those get to stay, but everything associated with the factory gets returned. And then remember, again, with the factory action, I'm allowed to now affect or set the price for any factory that was affected by this action. So if I built or modernized, I can now adjust the price and then recalculate my appeal on the appeal track. The next action is the quality action. This allows me to increase my quality one, two, or three levels based on how much administration, uh, how, how many administration fees I pay. So if I was to place this on this spot, I pay six in administration fees, and you can see that allows me to increase or set one level of quality. If this was occupied and I was forced to place it here, I have to pay eight administration fee, but you can see only six of it, so I still only get one level. 
you can see the highest amount of administration fee you can pay is 10. So there are ways with development tiles that allow you to pay extra administration fees to use that higher level. But in this example, I'll pay six and I get a set one level of quality. I can set it on any factory I choose. So I just take one of my quality markers and then I'll set it to the plus one on the qualities. Let's say instead, as a different example, instead of using my basic quality marker, let's say I had acquired an advanced quality action. I could instead play this one if I had it in my possession, and I'd want to place it on the eight administration fee because that allows me to take two quality actions. I could do those, do that in the same factory or different factories. So if I did it in the same factory, I would simply do one, and then two, so two levels of quality increase, or I could do one and one. And then keep in mind the bonus action associated with quality is now I'm able to adjust the price in all the factories affected by that action. Adding quality to your factories is a permanent increase, so you'll always recalculate your appeal, taking your base plus any quality modifiers plus any distribution modifiers, and then reset your appeal on the track. You're limited to a maximum of four total quality unless you get a development tile that it lets you go above that. Next is the distribution action. Uh, this allows me to increase distribution levels based on the maximum of the action marker and the administration fees I pay. So if I place this, even if I place this here and paid six, I can only apply a maximum of four of my administration fees towards this action. So that'd be a more optimal play. So I pay four for the administration and I can use a maximum of four of those pounds to apply towards the distribution action. You have to pay for each level of a distribution increase. So since I have a maximum of four, that one will cost me one. If I decide to do that, I have to pay one plus two, so that use three of my four up. So I could use maybe the last one to place one here. So you pay for each level that you're rotating a distribution marker. In addition, you could also use any unspent administration fees to simply affect the price in another factory. So the distribution action allows me to affect the price in the factories that are affected by the action. So one plus two is three. I've used three of my points. I have one left over. Instead of placing another distribution marker in a different factory, um, maybe I simply just want to use that unspent to adjust uh, the price in a factory. Maybe this already had one, and to increase it, it would cost two, and I don't have the two, so I'm just going to use it to adjust the price. So that's an example of why you'd want to do that. Distribution is a temporary increase to your appeal. So once you do this and you reset your price, uh, you recalculate your appeal, at the end of the production cycle, for the good, this will rotate left, and we'll cover that. So this is a temporary one that decreases each production cycle, and if it was on level one, at the end of a production cycle, you would simply discard it. The next action is the worker action. This allows you to hire or fire workers. You'll see that the bonus action associated with the worker action allows you to select one of the special markers. So there really is no benefit to paying a higher administration fee. So you probably want to get as low as possible. I pay the six administration fee, although this doesn't affect the power of the higher worker action. You can hire as many workers as you like. They come straight from the job market. You can add them to any shifts you like in your factories, or you can also add them to your warehouse. So you can see one worker can go in each of these indicated spots, and for each worker, it gives you one cube of good storage in either the row or the column. So by placing the worker here, I can now store three bread, or three food, three clothes, three cutlery, and three lamps. By also having a worker here, I can have an extra cube here, 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 and here. So this now gives me this entire column of storage. So with a worker here and here, I can actually have two cubes 
on these first three spots. One cube for him and one cube for him. When you're taking the worker's action, you can freely move around these workers in the warehouse. You're not allowed to move these workers around. Remember, these workers are only hired when you actually take the ship tiles and you're not allowed to freely move workers uh, between your shifts. If with this action you also want to fire workers or you only want to fire workers, you always start with the rightmost shift of a factory. You're never allowed, never allowed to fire the first shift of a factory. Those would only get removed if you're shutting down the factory. If there were any machines, which we'll cover next, those would get returned if there are no workers in the shift. So if I decide to fire all three of these workers in this shift, they simply get returned to the fired workers area. It's also important to remember that firing workers are only ever firing factory workers. You're not allowed to fire warehouse workers or ship workers at this point. Warehouse workers can be fired at the end of the decade, and then you'll remember ship workers only get fired if uh, we're returning ship tiles. Finally, you also can't uh, fire the exact same workers that you hired with this action. Also, you always hire from the job market, but if the job market is ever completely out, you can hire from the fired workers area. If there are no workers anywhere, then you're limited based on that and you couldn't hire anymore. Next is the machine action. This allows you to get one, two, or three machines based on the amount of administration you pay. So if I was, this was my turn and I got to pick my one action and that was my only spot left, I pay my 10 administration and that allows me to do a maximum of two machines since it met that six threshold. So I simply take machines and I have, I have to replace existing workers. You could not put a machine directly on the spot. Basically you're automating manual labor and it has to be in a spot that is, el is eligible for the worker to be upgraded to a machine where this one isn't. So I simply remove that worker and I put one machine there. And let's say I remove this worker. You can do it in the same factory or different factories. Basically, it's any workers you want to automate. And then these workers are fired and they get put in the fired workers area. Machines will give you lower production costs. A machine ever only costs one pound each, whereas each laborer, based on the current empty spot of the job market, in this example, would cost you three pounds for each laborer. The next action is the stock action. I have reset some of these to make room. So the amount of administration that you have to pay for the row doesn't affect the power. You can see the bonus icon is it allows you to take a special marker. And I should have mentioned the machine action it allows you to take a special marker also. You can do several things with the stock action. Um, this is when you can repay loans. Loans are repaid for 13 pounds each, and you have to repay loans before you can um, buy any additional shares back. The stock market action also allows you to buy or sell your own shares based on the share value. So if you wanted to buy shares back from the bank, because that's what determines the winner, it's shares times your share price for your total portfolio, you pay, pay the share price. The minimum price is always 10. So even if your share value marker was back here, if you're buying shares back from the bank, the minimum price you pay is 10. If you're selling shares to raise capital, for each share you sell, you get that value listed on the share track. With the stock action, you can also sell any goods you may have had stored in your warehouse. So let's say I had maybe some goods Maybe I had a, a food good and a clothes good because he, he allowed me to store in this section. They sell for the minimum price. So for the minimum price, it's here on your player board. So any bread or food sold from your warehouse is worth two each. Clothes are worth three each. Cutlery are four each. And lamps are five each when sold from the warehouse. The last thing you can do with the uh, stock action is you can acquire contracts for goods. You can ever only have one per good. You can put them on any spot you like. 
they can be on the same spot. Also, if you had a contract already on your harbor mat, with this action, you're allowed to increase it. Increase it. You can never decrease it, but you can always move up. You can even get a contract uh, if you don't even have the factory. But keep in mind that you're making an, a promise to fulfill this uh, during the next production cycle, and there's a penalty for unfulfilled contracts. The next action is the production action, and this is a special action marker that you would have had to acquire. This allows you to produce in one factory, and the shifts are based on the power of the tile. So here this allows you to produce in shifts one and two. The more powerful production actions allows you to produce in up to four of your shifts in one factory. So this is nice because it gives you the ability to produce goods outside of the normal production cycle, which we'll cover. So pay your administration costs, and you can decide to produce in one or two shifts. They're always the leftmost shifts of a factory. So I can decide I'm going to produce in these two shifts based on that action. And based on the capacity of this factory, you can see how many goods I'd get, two plus three. So I'd get five total goods with this production action since I'm using two shifts. The goods produced with the production action have to be stored in the warehouse. So in this example, I can only store uh, three clothes, so any excess would have to be discarded. And then the final step of the production action, you have to pay for the shifts that you chose to operate. So in this case, I operated two shifts, so I'd have to pay my labor or expense for these two shifts. So four workers times the labor expense of the last empty spot, which is three, so I'd have to pay 12 pounds to the bank. Also, if there were machines here, you'd pay one per machine. So in this example, I'm paying two laborers and one pound, one pound, if I decided to operate the bread instead of the clothing factory with this production action. The next action you can do is you can actually use one of your ship markers as a shipping action. You can only use one of them, so you have to place one ship on an administration fee spot, and the fee spot has to be greater than the capacity, or equal or greater than the capacity of the ship. So ideally, I'd like to place it there. Since that's occupied, I'd have to place it here to pay six administration fees. If that was empty, I could not place it there because that's not equal to or greater than the capacity of the ship. Once you pay your administration fee, this allows you to ship any combination of goods equal to your current contracts and the capacity of the ship. So I can ship up to four goods, but I also have to look at the contracts. I would have had to acquire a contract first. So here I have a clothes contract for two and a bread contract for two. So with a capacity for ship, I could ship both of these assuming I had them in my storage. And in my game, I've replaced the standard goods cubes with colored cubes for each player. So I could take two food and two clothes, fulfill both of these contracts, return those. These would just get returned to my personal supply. And since I had a capacity of four, I could do that. If one of these contracts was at four, I couldn't do it. You have to at least meet the minimum level or the exact level of the contract. Whenever you ship goods, you get the base value for each good. And the base value is listed on the factory tile. So for each of those two breads or food I shipped, I'd get eight pounds each for a total of 16. And then for the two clothes I shipped, I'd get 13 each or 26. And then finally, whenever you ship goods, um, I guess thematically it makes the shareholders nervous, so you always have to reduce your share marker uh, one per ship you used. Whenever you take the ship action, you're only ever allowed to use one ship. So you, since you used one ship, you'd simply go back one on the share value track. The final action, and it's a variant, is called the reorganization action. Uh, it always starts with the light side face up. There's a dark side also. When you place this action, it doesn't matter where you place it, 
you pay zero administration fees for placing this action. And what the action does, it allows you to take a special marker and adjust the price. If it's the light side, you can adjust the price in one factory. And then later when this gets taken back, it'll flip to the dark side and then you can place it and, when, and it'll stay on the dark side for the remainder of the game. And then when you play it here, you're allowed to take a special action and you can adjust the price in all factories. Also, if we get to decade 1790 and you haven't used the reorganization marker, all players get to flip it to the dark side and get to take advantage of setting the price in all factories. So these are all the different actions that you have available to you. Keep in mind that during this bread cycle, each player in turn, or, turn order only gets to select one action. Once all players have selected their one action, we go to the production phase for food. So during a production cycle, the active factory, in this case food, will produce for all players that have one. So we first look at the active good, and then based on the factory and the number of shifts, each player will determine their production output. So we can see with a level one factory, and I have three shifts occupied, the first shift produces two, the second shift one, and the third shift one. So I produce a total of four food. to kind of show how each shift produced those. So now I've got four total food to sell to the local English market. This is where I like to use colored cubes for each player. I think it makes it easier to visualize how the demand gets consumed. So the demand is equal to the number of empty spots on the job market. So in this example, during this production cycle, there's a demand for eight food in the English market. Each appeal level, will fulfill one of those demand and you do it in appeal order. So here's one way to see how it works. So the yellow player has the highest appeal, so they get to sell first to the English market. So we'll just kind of put one there to represent that. Then we go down to the next appeal level and then every player at a higher appeal level or at this one get to sell one. Higher appeal goes first. So since yellow has a higher appeal than red or black, for this appeal level, they get to sell first. If two players are tied, you would look at the quality level, and the quality level is the base value plus the quality marker, you don't consider distribution. So if two players are tied on the same row of the appeal, whoever has the highest quality gets to sell first. If you're tied with the importer, that's represented by the black cube, they always lose ties. So the red player would get to sell first in this example. So here, red sold and then black sells. Now we go to the next appeal level and it's the same thing. Yellow would sell first, then red, then black. All right, so I've placed those cubes there. Now we get to the final appeal level and although blue is here, remember yellow has higher appeal, so they get the chance first to fill that final spot, basically depriving uh, red, black, and blue the chance to fulfill the, to sell their remaining goods to the English market. Another way to mentally calculate it is by working from the bottom up. So in this case, we see that the total supply, assuming that we produced enough goods, uh, yellow wants to sell four, red three, black three, and blue one. So the total supply is 11, but we see the demand is only eight. So we know that there's gonna be three goods that are shorted. You could work from the bottom up. So blue is gonna get shorted first, then black, then red. And that's how it played out as we place the cubes the other way. A couple important rules about selling to the domestic market. It's mandatory that you sell your newly produced goods to the market. So when the English demanded this first good, if yellow produced it, uh, that player is obligated to sell to the domestic market. If on their turn, let's say they depleted uh, their newly produced goods, let's say yellow only produced two goods this cycle for whatever reason, but they're able to sell four based on their appeal. So their first two produced goods have to get sold, but maybe 
for their next two, they have the option of pulling stored goods from their warehouse. So maybe for these final two goods, if their newly produced goods were depleted, they have the option of pulling uh, from their warehouse to supply the English market, but that is optional, they're not obligated. So once their supply has been depleted, when their appeal comes up, if they have no more goods or choose not to sell a warehouse good, they simply pass, and that would give lower players the option to possibly fulfill uh, their sold goods. Also keep in mind, you really only have to go through this precise procedure if the um, supply exceeds the demand. If there's enough demand, if the demand was all the way up at 11 here, and you could see that players could only sell a maximum of 11 goods to the domestic market, then all players just simply sell their good and collect their revenues. A couple smaller points, you're only able to sell warehouse goods if your factory ran this cycle. So if you had closed down your factory but you still had warehouse goods, you're not allowed to sell them to the English market. Also, uh, we talked about when players are tied on appeal, we go to quality, so the base plus the quality markers. If there's still a tie, let's see, let's say red was down here. If there's still a tie, then all players can sell and you can actually exceed the demand in the English market. But that only comes at the end of the phase if players are tied on appeal and quality. Remember, importers always lose ties. Players that sold goods are going to receive revenue equal to their set price times the number of goods sold. So in this example, yellow had a price of seven times four goods sold to the English market, so they'd get 28 pounds from the bank. You're also now going to award share bonuses for selling to the English market. So any player that at least sold one will move their share marker up one, and if players sold two, they would move their share markers up two. So in this case, yellow and red both sold at least two. So they're both gonna get two advances on the share track. You also get a bonus advance on the share track if you have the highest appeal and you're the only one with the highest appeal. If you're tied, uh, there is no tiebreaker unless you actually have uh, the charisma development tile. So as long as you have the sole lead in the appeal track, you would get a bonus share advance. And then you'd also get a bonus share advance if you sold the most goods to the English market. Again, there's no ties. But since yellow sold the most goods with four, they would get a final share advance. So the most you could earn in a single production cycle is four advances. Um, up to two for selling at least two goods, and then one if you have the highest appeal, an additional one if you sold the most goods. There's also a development tile that we'll cover later called the Patron, and that allows you to sell one additional good. Um, that is also considered for um, domestic bonuses. So if you had the Patron tile for food, you could sell an additional good. I would just place it there, and then that could be counted as be counted towards bonuses for sold goods, uh, most sold goods during share bonus awarding. Once all players have received their revenues and you've awarded share bonuses, all players now must pay for all workers and machines in their factories for all shifts. So in this example, one, two, three, four workers. The lowest exposed price was here, so each worker would cost two pounds each. So that'd be a total of eight pounds plus one for each machine, so nine, ten. So a total of ten pounds to the bank for this production cycle. After you pay all your expenses for the factory, any distribution that was used is reduced by one level. That's easy to forget. And if you were already at one, you simply discard the tile. So reduce distribution. So now that you've completed domestic sales, now you can complete overseas sales as part of the production cycle. This allows you to sell either newly produced goods that you had left over after domestic sales or and or warehouse goods. These are basically getting sold to the East India Company. You're allowed to use one or two ships to sell these. 
Now, since this is the production cycle for food, I'm only allowed to fulfill and do overseas sales for a food contract. So I can sell based on the level of contract if I have warehouse goods or, remember, leftover goods from the production phase. I can use up to two ships because I've got a two ship maximum here and the capacity has to be able to store it. So in this example, I've got a food contract for six. I have six stored in my warehouse thanks to my warehouse workers and I can use both ships that add up to a capacity of six to sell all these. Whenever shipping goods, you get the base value of the factory used times each good sold. So eight pounds times the six goods. So 48 total pounds for sh shipping all these. And remember, you have to reduce your share price for each ship used. So since I used two ships during this production cycle, my share value would come down two steps on the track. Once you're done shipping, simply discard these goods back to your supply and then remove the contract. Let's say for whatever reason I was unable to fulfill this contract. Maybe it was here for eight and I did not have eight goods or I didn't have a ship capacity of eight. For each unfulfilled contract, it's gonna slide forward one on the track. And if it's already maxed out, then each time it's forced to slide to the right, you're gonna lose two share values uh, on the share track for not being able to fulfill this contract. But in this case, I was able to fulfill it, so that simply gets fulfilled, and I'll discard these goods cubes that I shipped off. Once we get done with overseas sales, any excess cubes have to either be stored in the warehouse or discarded. So you can see that newly produced cubes, if they're not sold to the domestic market, and they're not shipped, would have to be stored in the warehouse or discarded. At the end of a complete production cycle, the first player would simply rotate clockwise to the next player, and then you move on to the next production cycle, repeating all the steps, the economy phase, the action phase, and then going through the whole production phase. When you've completed a production cycle for each of the four goods and you get to the end of a round, the first thing that you do is return all your action markers that you have on the track. You're now going to pay for your warehouse workers and your ship workers. So in this example, I've got two warehouse workers and one ship worker that's supporting that ship. Again, you always look on the lowest empty spot and pay the wages for each of those workers. It's at this point now, after you've paid their salaries, that you can freely fire any warehouse workers. But keep in mind, if I was to fire this worker, it may affect and force me to discard this good that that worker was maintaining. Anytime you fire workers or move them around, make sure you adjust goods and you may, have, may be forced to discard goods. Once everybody's paid for their workers on their harbor mat, flip over the event, and resolve the event for all players. The final thing you'll do at the end of a complete round is determine a new start player. Whichever player has the lowest score or portfolio value, remember the lowest score is the number of shares in your possession multiplied by the share value. Whoever's portfolio is the lowest decides who the start player is going to be and simply give them the start player marker. If it's tied, whoever has the least cash, and if it's still tied, whoever's furthest from the start player. There's also a development tile called the Charisma tile, and it's here that they would have to declare whether they'd like to intervene and actually set and determine who the start player is. And then play would proceed simply to the next round, going through the same phases. Once you complete the final round of the game and get to the final event, Pay your workers as usual, and the final event of the game is always the end of game. So several things will happen. First, players will pay off any outstanding loans. Loans get paid off at 13 pounds each. If a player has any loans left, they automatically lose the game, so pay off all loans. Next, players can sell any stored goods on their warehouse for the minimum value 
for each of those goods. Next, players will buy as many shares as possible of their own stock based on the current share value and how much money they left it, have left uh, in their supply. They'll take shares from the bank. After players buy their shares from the bank, there are two types of penalties that can occur to your share value. The first one is unfulfilled contracts. For each unfulfilled contract, players would lose share value equal to the contract. So in this case, if these were unfulfilled, they'd lose 10 places on the share value track. The other share value penalty that can occur is if a player hired workers in the last round for a factory that already produced without going back and using a subsequent produce action, then they get penalized. So for example, if we already finished the production cycle for clothes and we're on these factories now and a player takes an action to add workers to a factory that already produced, thus trying to maybe artificially uh, create market demand, then they're obligated to come back and use the production action to produce in that factory. So as a reminder, just put a the first worker here to say, oh, I've got to come back and actually produce on this factory. And as long as you do that, you're fine. If you don't come back and produce, then the player would get penalized. They would lose four uh, moves on the share value track. They'd go back four spots and they have to return two of their own shares back to the bank. Once you do that, players will now calculate their total portfolio value, uh, the number of owned shares times their current share price, and the highest total port portfolio value wins the game. If there's a tie, whichever player has the most remaining money would break the tie. Now let's cover all the events and development tiles in the game. So starting with the events, the bureaucracy event, which appears on every game, uh, the level two row of the administration table is now blocked to all players for the rest of the game once this event gets resolved. The Hamburg credit crisis, all players have to immediately pay 10% of their cash to the bank, uh, standard rounding. So if it's a 0.5 or higher, round up. The war on the continent, uh, immediately all players get to either set or raise their distribution plus one in each factory, and then you have to immediately increase the price by one. That way the appeal doesn't get affected. The Crown Jubilee, uh, players may sell one additional cube. This works just like an extra patron, uh, and you have to mark it when it's used. Lobby, each player in turn order uh, gets to select a special action marker, so clockwise from start player. Keep in mind it has to still be limited by the current level or use the inventor. Made in England, uh, twice each player gets to set or raise their distribution by plus one and then you get to adjust uh, the appeal or just recalculate the appeal. Ludism, uh, each player has to remove one machine in each factory and you replace those machines uh, with fired workers. If there's no fired workers left, then you take them from the job market to replace each of those machines, one machine in each factory. Navigation acts, uh, the importers will all move back two spaces, but not below zero. And then at the end of the decade, put this on the next decade, at the end of the decade, they're all going to advance forward to. The opium war, all ships for that round coming up have a reduced capacity of one. And at the end of the decade, after you're done paying all your crews, all players are forced to discard one ship. The recession, each player has to move their share price back two steps on the share track, but not below zero. Royal Society, uh, each player receives four pounds uh, times their highest factory level. So the highest factory level you can get in any of your factories is four. So four times four would be 16 is the maximum, plus two for each of your development tiles. And you'll remember that you can have a maximum of four development tiles. So two times a maximum of four would be eight. So the maximum pounds a player could earn from this would be 16 plus eight. 
social unrest, immediately pay one pound for each worker in your factories and on your harbor mat, so your warehouse and your ship workers. The threat of strike, uh, during the next turn, each worker's wage is increased or raised by one pound during this decade. The World Exhibition, four workers are permanently removed from the job market and you remove those from the game. The economic crisis, five workers are moved from the fired area to the job market if possible. Steam power, uh, each player plays, pays immediately one pound for each machine and one pound per capacity of all their ships. And then the end of game. The different types of development tiles. Uh, the first one is the accountant. This allows you to pay or reduce up to two pounds at administration cost. But keep in mind, only the actual paid amount affects the action. So if you were to put something on this 10 row that would, and decide to increase it by two, so you pay 12 administration costs, for example, that might allow you to use the second level of quality improvement. If you were to place it here and pay zero, then you paid zero administration cost for that action. The administrator, this allows you to use the level two action row, even if the bureaucracy event is in play. In addition, you never have to pay those extra two pounds of fee if you decide to reuse an action. The agent in the colonies, this allows you to change the number of goods required to fulfill a contract by plus or minus one. The broker, um, after the event is resolved at the end of the round, uh, you may sell warehouse goods. Ba basically, you're taking an abridged stock action. You can sell warehouse goods for their minimum value. You may also buy or sell your shares. The only thing you're not allowed to do is get additional contracts. In addition, um, if you decide to discard the tile, that's what the red asterisk means, you discard the tile if, instead of taking a special action marker, when you get that check mark bonus action, you can discard the broker tile and buy one to two shares for half their current price. The Charisma Development Tile allows you to break ties uh, for the bonuses when evaluating who has the highest appeal and who has the most domestic goods sold that production cycle. In addition, uh, you can discard the tile and declare the new start player at either the end of a production cycle or at the end of the round. You just have to declare that intent before the normal player with the lowest portfolio value would declare that action. When this is used in that way, uh, either the player that played the Charisma tile or the one that was declared the new start player, they're not allowed to retake this Charisma tile with their very next action. Uh, the developer has to be discarded when it's used. But you're allowed to reduce uh, the cost of building or modernizing a factory by five pounds per factory. So you can use this um, for, a, for multiple factories, but you can only use it once per factory. So if you buy a factory, you get a five pound discount. You couldn't modernize that same factory and also get the discount, uh, but you could modernize multiple factories and for each one, take five pounds less for each one. The next one is the engineer. This allows you to raise quality levels above the maximum of four. So you get to flip the tile over and you can raise it to plus five or plus six. Uh, this applies to all of your factories. And this will actually even stay if you discard uh, the engineer tile. In addition, you get to freely choose your administration costs whenever you're taking the quality action. So regardless of which row you place it on, you get to declare how much you're paying an administration fee, which affects the action power. Engineering works. Uh, the player with this will receive one pound from the bank for each machine that's purchased by other players, not you, but by other players. Extra ships. Uh, you may increase production by one good uh, during a production cycle or when taking the production action. You have to return the tile when it's used. 
Next is the foreman. Um, in one factory, so when you take the tile, you've got to declare which factory it's being used on. Uh, wages are decreased by two pounds per worker, uh, a maximum of four workers, and the minimum you always have to pay is at least one pound per worker. You can reassign this, so in lieu of taking another action marker with a bonus, you can instead assign this to a different factory. So you could potentially get this discount multiple times in the same decade or round. The inventor, when you take this, you have to immediately pay five pounds. You're like investing in research and development. And then you're allowed to exceed plus one level, so one additional level higher than the current round restriction whenever you're taking an action marker, um, a ship, or you're modernizing a factory to a higher level. And then you make a decision. You can either discard it or you can pay the next level to keep it. So if I decide to keep it, I immediately pay the 10 and then I get to keep it. And then that will continue. So the next time I use it, I'll get that decision again whether to keep it or discard it. The office, uh, the player receives an additional five pounds whenever you fulfill at least one contract. So you can get a maximum of five pounds for the action if you're fulfilling one or more contracts. The patent. Uh, you get to add a free or a virtual two pounds to whatever you paid in administration costs for the distribution action. Uh, keep in mind the accountant happens first, and this only applies when you're taking the distribution action, but you get a virtual two administration uh, pounds added to that. You can also choose to discard it uh, to get a one-time um, increase of two levels or two rotations. They can be in the same or different factories. The patron, there's one patron tile for each of the four goods. Uh, the patron allows you to sell one additional good beyond your appeal uh, to the domestic market. So it's a domestic patron. And as we talked about, it affects potentially the different share bonuses. The school, uh, whenever you're taking the machine action, you may move workers that were fired by the machines. Instead of returning them to the fired area, they can get returned to any other shift um, on your player board for other factories or your warehouse. And you can only do this once per worker. So you can't move the worker and then automate him and then move him again. In addition, during the production, um, you, you may decide to shut down the highest operating shift. But if you do shut it down, you don't get any production from that shift, but you also don't have to pay any costs for that shift. The small warehouse. The small warehouse allows you to store up to five goods without having to use your large warehouse. Basically, you just place these on the far right side of your price track uh, for the factory that you're deciding, um, as long as there's room if you haven't set your price too high. Um, and they can be transferred freely uh, to and from the large warehouse. The workshop. You get to add a free or a virtual three pounds uh, to your paid administration costs uh, when you're taking the machine's action. Keep in mind the accountant would apply first. In addition, all machines in one factory that you assign this to uh, cost a total of one pound, regardless of how many machines are in the factory. And keep in mind you can also reassign this in lieu of taking a special action marker. The harbor master. Um, at the warehouse and the harbor, all of your wages are decreased by two pounds per worker, um, up to a maximum of four workers, and the minimum you always have to pay per worker is at least one pound. The investor, um, you can receive eight pounds from the bank whenever you decide to waive an additional bonus action, whether it's taking a marker or setting the price um, in factories, you can waive that and get an additional eight pounds. The load master, you can increase the capacity of each ship by plus one. There's no additional crew required, and this would counteract uh, the event opium war. The manager allows you to swap uh, the additional or the bonus action taken. So if you take an action that allows you to take a special action, you can decide instead um, to take the price adjustment action. The price adjustment must be made in a factory that was affected 
by the main action, and if the main action was a stock, stock exchange, then the price can be adjusted in any one factory. If the manager is used in conjunction with the reorganization action, uh, the player may waive taking a special tile and instead adjust the prices in two factories if it's still on the light colored side. The supervisory board, uh, you can discard this and you may claim a special marker that's being actively returned by a player. So basically just interrupt their discard of the development tile, discard your supervisory board, and then claim that tile. And then finally, Wealth of Nations. This allows you to play an action tile for zero administration fees, and you can use this once per round. So this basically gives you an additional spot on this track with a value of zero that you can place an action marker directly on that. So those are all the events and development tiles in Arkwright, and that should be everything you need to set up and play the game. So as an extra, let's cover some of the modular variants and promos that you can add to the game. The first are the bonus markers. Each player will have a domestic and a shipment bonus marker. You take both of these, and all players will just place them on the one value of the share track. And then basically you're keeping track of your personal bests in both domestic shipping and, I'm sorry, domestic sales and foreign shipping. So let's say one round, maybe I was able to sell three bread to the domestic market. And then in a later production cycle, I shipped five lamps off. So the type of goods don't matter. It's just the quantity during a single action. So you're just keeping track of your personal best. And then what happens at the end of the game, you'll multiply these two values together and add that to your total portfolio value. So in this case, three times five, I would add 15 points to my end portfolio value. The maximum these can ever go up to is 10. So your maximum score for these bonus markers, 10 times 10, 100, added to your end portfolio score. The next one is the share value competition. You're going to place this on space 25 of the share value track. And basically, uh, the first player that can advance their marker onto or past uh, 25 receives instantly one share from the bank and they get that marker. If more than one player do it, uh, does it on the same round, the highest share value at the end of that cycle would win. Um, if they're still tied, uh, players may each buy one share for half price, rounded up, but nobody gets the marker. But if you get it all by yourself, you get a full share from the bank and you get the marker. What the marker allows you to do is you can discard it at any time during the game to avoid having to move your share backwards due to an emergency sale. The next one is the shipping competition. You'll start by placing this on the sixth space of the share value track. And for this one, it's the first player to ship six or more goods. Uh, the award for that is they get to advance their share marker two spaces forward, and they get the marker. They get to take this. Um, like the other one, if there's a tie, whoever ships most that cycle would win. If there's still a tie, um, both of the tied players may advance their share value plus one, but nobody gets the marker. But if you get it all by yourself, you get a plus two share advance, and you get the marker. In this case, what the marker allows you to do is you can discard it at any time during the game to avoid uh, increasing one of your unfulfilled contracts. The final one is the Noblesse Oblige promo. Basically, you'll lay out this board. If it's a two-player game, you'll use the reverse side. You also are going to lay out these purveyor development tiles with the rest of the development tiles, and they are laid out in addition to your normal draw. So these can be taken just like a regular development tile, and as always, you're still limited to four total development tiles at any one time. So you'd have to discard something to um, replace one if you took it. The way this works is at the start of each round or decade, you're going to place a generic goods token on each empty space um, equal to the current or previous rounds. So in this example, I'm assuming that we're in round two. 
or level two, sorry. And I'm going to place an empty cube on any, or a cube on any empty spot. So maybe this was taken from a previous round, and then I'll put it one there. So each of these can only ever have one spot. If we were in a level three decade or later, we could fill up each of those. So that happens at the beginning of a round. So what happens is that during a production cycle, before players sell goods to the domestic market, they have the opportunity to sell their goods in the luxury market. It's important to remember that you can only sell your newly produced goods in the luxury market. You're not allowed to sell any warehouse goods in the luxury market. The player with the highest reputation will go first. And reputation is defined as your base factory value plus any quality modifiers, but not distribution. So this would not come into play. So you would take 11 plus 1, so that's 12. You would use a machine token to just mark what your current reputation is at the moment. So base factory plus any quality markers. What the purveyor development tile that lets you do is you can use this instead of your current quality value. So if I had that, 11 plus 3, my current reputation would be 14. The sale in the luxury market is completely voluntary. Um, if a player passes, they drop out of the luxury step this cycle and they just return that machine to the supply. Um, if it's tied, if two players have equal reputation, then you use turn order. Uh, the start player would go first and then, then clockwise. So the player with the highest reputation, let's say it's the yellow player in this case, has the opportunity to sell one of their newly produced goods. So this is during a production cycle. So you can see with this level two factory, I've produced four goods. They can now sell one of these to the highest spot on the luxury market. So this is the highest spot for clothes. So you basically remove this. You would remove one of your produced goods from the game. And the value you would get would be equal to your, repu your current reputation value, or where your machine marker is, 14 plus any modifiers here, so plus one. So you would get 15 pounds from the bank. After you do that, you simply move your reputation down one, and then the player with the next highest reputation would go. And in an example, this may be the player with the next reputation, so they could go again, or it may be another player. So each time the player with the highest reputation gets the option of selling, taking the highest marker on the market, taking pounds equal to their current reputation value plus the bonus and then they slide their marker down one and you're just going to continue this until all players have passed or all goods have been depleted for the active good in the production cycle so each of the variants and promos that i just talked about can be added to the game as the players see fit